want to talk, I think, a little bit about maybe a more cautious view of a lot of the technology. And one of the interesting things about this technology is that it, it's captivated our lives in ways that uh, certainly our, our parents and grandparents would not have been captivated by it, I think. But uh, in Plato's dialogue, Phaedrus, he lets us in on a conversation between Thuth and the inventor of the pen and uh, Thamus the king, who, when the inventor presents his invention, he tells the king that, oh, this is an extraordinary new technology. It's going to do wonders. It's going to enable human beings to preserve their knowledge. Well, the king tells him, it's not for the inventor to tell us uh, what the benefit of the invention is, but for others who are going to look at the invention to tell. And he actually, the king tells him that it's quite the opposite of what you think, that the introduction of the pen is going to cause the loss of knowledge and not the preservation of knowledge, because people will no longer rely on their memories, uh, that knowledge won't come from inside of themselves, but from outside of themselves. Uh, the interesting thing about that story is that inventors often, in fact, almost always, invariably tell us about the upsides of their technology and their inventions. And they rarely look at the downside of the inventions or the externality. So in the past, people were extremely wary of innovation. In fact, the word invention had a very negative connotation in ancient Greece. It had a negative connotation in the Christian world and the Muslim world. Our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Iyaka wa umur. Beware of novelties, uh, because religion by its very nature is a conservative enterprise. But it also is very wary of destabilizing elements. When things change too rapidly, things become destabilized. It was Machiavelli who really put a positive spin on inventions in the print. There's a real change after Machiavelli and the approach to invention. So one of the modern myths that many uh, progressives will constantly remind us is that you can't stop progress. There are many iterations of this. One of them is you can't turn the clock back. And I think there's some assumptions embedded in this. One of them is that progress is good by its nature and also that it's a juggernaut. It's an unstoppable force uh, that we simply have to submit to. So I want to argue that we actually have historical examples that counter both those views. One example, when the car was first invented, uh, there was a lot of pushback in cities about the cars because they were very noisy and problematic. But one of the arguments was it was so much cleaner than the horse. So uh, we can put that one to rest. <laughs> so, but there are other really interesting examples. So another one is in the Second Lateral Council under Pope Innocent II in 1139. He actually outlawed the use of crossbows because he considered them to be unethical. And he said they were not something that a Christian could engage in. And he actually said, crossbow is an instrument of the devil and hateful to God and unfit for Christian. So part of what makes that technology so odious was that it could take a peasant who could learn to use it in a week and he could destroy an armored knight because a crossbow could actually penetrate the armor. And this knight who took 10 years to master his martial arts would simply be killed at the hand of this peasant. In 1589, an inventor in England, William Lee, attempted to convince Queen Elizabeth to support a knitting machine that would replace hand knitting. Lord Hunson asked the Queen to grant Lee a patent and to use crown money to invest in, in a factory to produce the machine. The Queen refused, saying, my Lord, I have too much love for my poor people who obtain their bread by knitting to give money to forward an invention which will tend to their ruin by depriving them of employment. In his remarkable book, Giving Up the Gun, an old parent shows us that the Japanese at the time in the 17th century comprised one of the most advanced pre-modern societies on earth. The Japanese were actually, once the gun was introduced in Japan in uh, 1543, they became the finest producers and mass producers of the musket. They actually developed a musket that was also waterproof, which was one of the main problems in Europe, using muskets in warfare. But interestingly enough, they, there were three shoguns, Nobunaga and Hideyoshi and Lord Tokugama. And these people unified the warring uh, principalities of Japan and actually outlawed the gun. And so for 300 years, Japan actually chose to reject the technology. This is a really important historical example of where a society decided, and part of the reason for the decision was again 
they saw that it was one, a cruel way of killing people, but another that a samurai who spent 20 years mastering the martial arts could be killed by a peasant with a musket. Another really interesting example is in the Ottoman Empire, for almost 300 years, they chose not to use the Gutenberg printing press of movable print. One of the myths is they did it because they were worried about knowledge coming in uh, to the Ottoman Empire, which is actually not true. The, the main reason why they did not use the printing press is there were tens of thousands of scribes that would have lost their jobs because of this. And I think this is an aspect that we really don't think about when we think about AI. Another really important thing to think about is the, the wise ancient Greek had the engineer, Hephaestus, was actually crippled. And his enemy was Athena, the goddess of wisdom. The reason that Hephaestus, I think, was crippled is because technologies tend to cripple us. We're all using the crutches of technology now. And each time we adopt a new technology, we lose something of our autonomy. It becomes a crutch. And most of us can't even imagine life now without a cell phone. And yet the vast majority of us are old enough to remember how life was without a cell phone. Our young people won't remember that. They have no idea of what a world without cell phone was like. But I think most of us do remember it, and perhaps fondly. Again, the idea that you can't stop progress. I think it's a very dangerous idea if that progress is harmful. One of the, the really tragic aspects of modern technology, I think, is the alienating nature of the technology, the distraction of the technology, the fact that we're constantly checking our cell phones, we're constantly being distracted. Well, it's very interesting that Bethlehem, which was the first mental hospital in England, was actually called Bethlehem for the incurably distracted. We forget that distraction in English actually means mentally deranged. Franz Kafka, who I consider actually a formidable theologian, uh, said that evil is whatever distract. And uh, the great Catholic tradition has ascidia as one of the seven deadly sins, which could be interpreted, sometimes it's translated as sloth, meaning like a spiritual laziness. But it was actually understood by the great church desert fathers as distractibility, this idea of constantly being distracted. And I think this is what a lot of people are suffering from. So we now have a massive mental illness crisis. There are many, many factors to it, but I think one of the real factors is, is the types of technology that our young people are being exposed to and are growing up with. We have a, a fentanyl crisis in the United States that's taking about 55,000 lives a year. Marx reminded us when he said that religion was the sigh of the oppressed creatures, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless condition. It is the opium of the people. In other words, Marx was actually trying to understand why people needed religion. Well, part of the reason was to numb them of the pain of the world, because it's a difficult place to be. If we don't have religion, then opium becomes the opium of people. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, warned us of the latter days, the antichristic period. One of the things that he told us about the Antichrist, that he would make the sky pour forth rain, he would make the blind sleep, cure the leopard, he would have mountains of wheat to satiate the poor who would follow him in hopes of gaining that benefit. He said that he would travel in every city in 40 days. They asked him how he would do that. He said, like a wind that leaves behind a cloud. And so I think it's very interesting that we have to really think seriously about where this technology is going. I go to universities, I walk through colleges, I see everybody bent over these machines. Something really has changed in a very short period of time. And change should always be considered with great deliberation. So where we're going, I don't know. But I think we have to think seriously about the dangers of AI, what people are going to do, and then also cui bono, who benefits from artificial intelligence? Who benefits from it? When we eliminate all these jobs, when people get universal income, what are they going to do? How are they going to live? What is the purpose of life? What type of meaning in life will they have? I think these are all serious questions that we have to greatly consider. One of the verses that was revealed in the Quran, the Quran says, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where then are you going? And I think this is something we have to ask ourselves because God allows you turns on the road of life. And I think the possibilities of metanoia should be very seriously considered.